Good morning. Welcome to Trinity United Methodist Church. My name is Rob Almey, and I'm the pastor here at Trinity. We are delighted that you are here to worship with us this morning. You picked a great Sunday to be here. You picked a great Sunday to be here for a couple of different reasons. First, I want to let you know that this is a communion Sunday as it's the first Sunday of the month. And so if you have not already gathered some elements to celebrate Holy Communion with us, I want to encourage you to pause the video and to go grab those elements. It'd be most appropriate to have some bread and some juice, but should you not have those items uh, in your house. We invite you to find something that would be a good equivalent. It's also a great Sunday for you to worship with us online because this is the first Sunday since we have started doing online worship that we will have singing. We, will have, we have singers with us as we record uh, this worship service. And so we are delighted and it's such a joy to have them with us. And so we want to say a special thank you to Annette and to Beverly, to June and to Regina for blessing us with music this morning. If you are a guest with us this morning, we especially want to welcome you. We're delighted that you are here to worship with us. And whether you're a guest with us this morning or you regularly worship with us at Trinity. I want to call your attention to the link in the description of the video to register your worship attendance. It would be a blessing to us to know that you've been here worshiping with us. So I want to encourage you to click that link and to fill out that form so that we would have a record of your attendance with us. You also find inside of the description of that video some other links. One is to the worship order. That is the order of worship that we will use. It's the liturgy that we will use for our worship this morning. If you want to pause the video and click on that and print it off, I encourage you to do so. I also want to let you know about a special announcement, and that is that our United Methodist women are selling some very special pillows that they make. On these pillows, you, there's a picture of Trinity United Methodist Church. And so I have one of these. When I first learned that the Methodist women made these pillows, I asked for them to make me one, and they have made me one. I have enjoyed it thoroughly. These pillows are really great quality, much better than anything that you can find at the store, much better than my pillow or anything like that, and it has a picture of your favorite church, Trinity United Methodist Church, right on it. They're selling these pillows to help raise money to fund scholarships to Westview on the James, which is our district camp and retreat facility to help send kids from our church and our community to there. So for our suggested donation of $30, you too can own a Trinity United Methodist Church pillow. In addition to just being a great looking pillow, they are also great if you find yourself a little sleepy in the middle of the sermon to just lay your head down and to think and meditate on the words of my message. I'm just kidding, of course. But I encourage you, if you haven't gotten one of these pillows, to go ahead and do one and support a great cause that the United Methodist women are engaging in. Having uh, made those announcements, I'm going to invite you to join with me in the call to worship. You can find that printed in your order of worship. This morning, I will be saying, the, I'll be reading all of the words, but I invite you to join with the words that are in bold at home. God speaks to all people everywhere. Rise, shine, for your light has come. The true light that enlightens every person has come into the world, revealing that all creation is one in God. Rise, shine, all you Christians. Your light is here in this place. It is present in you and in your neighbor. Jesus, the light of the world, is shining love into the dark corners of confusion, fear, and despair. Rise, you people of the world, shine all of humanity, for your light has come indeed. Here we are, Lord, illumine us, purify us, and shine through us as we worship, listen, and respond to you. Amen. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Let us pray. Gracious God, you are so good to us all of the time, and all of the time you are good. 
Father God, we pray that as we come and worship you this morning, that your name would be lifted on high. We pray, O oh God, that your spirit would dwell powerfully among us and within us, that our worship today would help us to turn our focus and our hearts, our lives to you. Lord, we say this morning as we come to worship you that we need you. You are the source of our strength. So, Lord, I pray that in the midst of this worship time that you would speak to our hearts and minds, that we would leave this time of worship as changed people, filled with your love, ready to let our light shine so that we might love you more fully and love others as you have called us to love. These things we pray in the sweet and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I want to invite you to join with me in singing our first hymn for this morning. It's number 397 in the hymnal. It's called, I Need Thee Every Hour. You can find the words printed in your order of worship or there up on your screen. I need thee every hour.
I want to welcome all the children that happen to be worshiping with us this morning. We're so glad that you are here to worship with us as well as we come to the time for all God's children in our worship service. Boys and girls, one of the things that I really love about the Bible is all the many different characters in the Bible. And there's some really interesting characters in the Bible. And for these next weeks here in church, we are going to be focusing on one of those characters that is really interesting. And his name is Elijah. And so today we are going to introduce you to who Elijah is. Elijah was a prophet of God. A prophet is uh, somebody who is the mouthpiece of God. God speaks through the prophet, and he often will speak through the prophet to really important people like the king. Such was the case with the prophet Elijah. When God called Elijah to be a prophet, he told him to go to the king of Elijah's day, and the king of Elijah's day was named Ahab. Now, King Ahab wasn't a very good king. In fact, he, we might say that he was an evil king. He led God's people astray and caused them to worship things that they really shouldn't have been worshiping. And God gave Elijah a special message to give to King Ahab, which wasn't a very nice message. The message that Elijah had to give to King Ahab was that there was going to be a big drought meaning there wasn't going to be any rain for a number of years in the place where they all lived. Well, after Elijah gives King Ahab this message, God then tells Elijah to go to a special place called the Kareth Ravine. Can you say Kareth Ravine? Yeah, the Kareth Ravine. This was a place that was kind of in a valley, if you will. It was kind of a, a hidden place, far away from anybody, far away from Xbox or social media, far away from friends and from family and all of those things that we have come to know. And he had to be all alone. Well, because there was a drought, and because Elijah just couldn't order up some DoorDash, God had to provide for Elijah. And one of the ways that God provided for Elijah was that he had the ravens, you know, the birds called the ravens. He had the ravens go and get food for Elijah and bring food back to Elijah in the morning and in the evening. And not only that, but God also gave Elijah something to drink through a brook that ran in this Kareth Ravine, some water that ran through the Kareth Ravine. So as God called Elijah to go to this special place called the Kareth Ravine, to this valley of sorts, where God was going to work on Elijah because he had some important work for Elijah to do later on, God provided for Elijah. And so the special message that I want you and me and all of us to take away from this story about Elijah is that when God calls us and when God asks us to do something, God will always provide what we need. That as God calls, God provides. And so later on in life, or maybe even tomorrow for you, if God asks you to do something, or God calls you to do something, know that He will give you everything you need. He will take care of you as He asks you to do something. You can always count on that. That yes, it might be scary about what God might call you to do. You might have some fear, but you can rest assured that God will take care of you. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Let's pray. God, we thank you that just as you ask us to do things, and just as you ask Elijah to do things, so you provide for us. You give us all we need, that we don't have to be afraid, but that you love us so much that you give to us each and every good thing that we need for the journey that you call us on. May we never forget. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our scripture reading for this morning actually comes from 1 Kings chapter 17, as, as I've introduced to our young people this morning. It is the story and the meeting of Elijah and Ahab and God's call for Elijah to go to the Kareth Ravine to undergo some important transformation, as we'll hear about in the message, that Elijah has to go so that God can use him later on. So listen now for the word of God. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except my, at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So Elijah did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up, and because there had been no rain in the land, then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I might have a drink? And as he was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a, a piece of bread. As surely as the God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord says, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family, for the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the Lord, word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Inside of the description of that video this morning that you are watching, you will find a link to the message download. If you go ahead and click on that and open that up, you will find the, message, the outline for my message for this morning. I invite you to print that off and to follow along. And as you follow along, so that's a place to take notes. There's also some fill in the blanks that you can fill in. And I'd also remind you that if you are just joining us, we want to welcome you. And whether you have been uh, watching this whole time but haven't yet had a chance, there's also a link there to register your worship attendance. We would be our blessing to know that you are worshiping with us this morning. I encourage you to click on that link and to fill out the registration form this morning. But before we get into our message for this morning, I want to ask that you would join me in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, I pray this morning that as I come to proclaim your word, that you would protect me from me, that you would hide me behind the cross of Jesus Christ, that after all has been said and done this morning, after your word has been proclaimed, that he would be glorified and exalted, that we would 
having heard your word, draw closer to him. We pray, O oh God, that just as you breathe your Holy Spirit upon these words, so you breathe your Holy Spirit into our hearts to transform us into the followers you would have us to be. We pray all these things in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior and your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Today at Trinity United Methodist Church, we are beginning a brand new series of messages centered around one of the more colorful characters that we will find in all of the Bible. But he comes from the Old Testament, from the first two-thirds of our Bible, and his name is Elijah. We are introduced to Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17, that passage that I read for you this morning. Let me spend a little bit of time this morning painting a picture for you, setting the scene, if you will, for the historical backdrop about what is happening in these times in which Elijah is called by the Lord to prophesy so that we'll have a better understanding of the story of Elijah. The nation of Israel that has come out of Egypt and has come into the promised land and conquered the present, the, has conquered the promised land, has by this time divided into two kingdoms, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Our story with Elijah takes place in the northern kingdom. Elijah is a prophet in the northern kingdom who prophesies, as we see this morning, to the king Ahab, who is king of the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom, church, had experienced 19 consecutive evil kings. Now, I know we all have our different opinions about the presidents that we have in the United States, and I don't want to get political this morning, but can you imagine 19 consecutive evil kings over a 200-year period? That's a lot of evil kings, and that's a lot of evil years. However, the current king of the northern kingdom named Ahab, was the most evil out of all of those kings that had come through those 200 years. And add to this, not only was Ahab evil, but he had a great evil partner and his wife Jezebel, who we will meet in the weeks to come. You add all of this together, and you have a making of a dark and corrupt time in the northern kingdom. King Ahab and Jezebel and those that came before them encouraged God's people to worship other gods besides the Lord God Almighty. In fact, they encouraged it. They set up special places of worship. They created idols. They encouraged worship of other gods. Not only this, but they, as they worshiped other gods, engaged in child sacrifice. They had temple prostitutes who worked the temple, so to speak, as they encouraged people, as their spiritual act of worship, to have relations with these temple prostitutes, again, and call it worship. Well, God looks on all this for 200 years, and then he finally says, enough is enough. I have had it. I have had enough. But instead of hailing down fire and brimstone, instead of sending a lightning bolt to take care of the evil king or some of the evil people, instead of raising up an army, a foreign army, to go against Israel and take the people into exile, instead of doing any of that, God raises up a man. And that man's name is Elijah. Now, one of the things you have to understand about the Bible, especially when it comes to the Old Testament, is that names meant something. Names of people, and as we'll see in a moment, names of places held significance oftentimes. And so the name Elijah really has three parts to it. And I'm not going to go into what each of the parts of the name means, but the whole name of Elijah means God is my Jehovah. Or in other words, God 
is my Lord. And we catch, we glimpse in the very name of Elijah part of what God is going to call him to do. And that is to stand up to Ahab, and that is to stand up to the false gods and to the false worship of his day and to proclaim that the Lord God of Israel is Jehovah. Now we first encounter Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. There it says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, right, that was the king, says to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few year, years, except at my word. Now let's stop here for a moment. Elijah the prophet is identified as a man from a place called Tishbe. They say then that he was a Tishbite. Now I want you to remember that because at the end of the message I'm going to come back to that and you'll see the significance that Elijah was a man from Tishbe, a Tishbite. But here Elijah the prophet of God delivers some bad news to the king Ahab. There's going to be a drought. Now, it wasn't going to be a drought that lasted a few days or even a few weeks or months. It wasn't going to be a drought that just lasted for a summer, but it was going to be a drought that, as we know, would last for three years. Friends, I can't begin to tell you what a devastating effect that would have had on the land of that day. What a devastating economic effect that would have had on the agricultural economy of Israel during that time. No rain meant no crops. No crops meant no money. No crops and no money meant no eating. It meant famine and it meant death. It is probably far beyond anything that you and I can even comprehend. It's far beyond anything that we have experienced in our own country of the United States. It would have been far worse than even the great depression. So Elijah proclaims that there will be this drought with this terrible economic collapse, no doubt, to follow, with this terrible famine and death and disease. Well, after announcing this wonderful bit of good news, note my sarcasm here, the Lord proceeds to take Elijah through three seasons, three distinct seasons, where he's going to do something in Elijah during these seasons to prepare to do something through Elijah in the future. He's going to do something in Elijah in these three seasons so that later on he can do something through Elijah. He will prepare Elijah in these seasons for the work that he will call him to do later on. The first season the Lord takes Elijah through in order to work in him and prepare him for later on and make him into the man of God he wants him to be is that the Lord takes Elijah into a season of isolated pain. So if you're following along in that message download, that's the first fill in the blank. He takes him through a season of isolated pain. Picking up with verse 2 and 3 of this chapter, Chapter 17, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, you know, after he had given the good news about the drought. Leave here, the Lord says, turn eastward and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. So God sends Elijah into a season of hiding, whereby Elijah is all alone. No family, no friends, no one else. Just him. It's in this season that Elijah will go through a time of deep preparation as God prepares to do a great work through him. Yes, Elijah is entering into a season of breaking so he can be used. He's being broken in private in the Kareth Ravine so he can later be used by God publicly. He's being broken in private to be used publicly. Remember earlier how I said names often have special meaning in the Old Testament? 
The name of this ravine that Elijah gets sent to by the Lord, the Kareth Ravine, is significant. The name Kareth means to be cut off from, or more literally, to be cut down, as in cutting down a tree. So as Elijah is sent into the Kareth Ravine, he is cut off from everyone else. He is alone. He is in a time of isolation. But it is a time when God is working in Elijah to make him into the man of God that he wants him to be. Now I know this morning that I am talking to some people who are watching this worship who have been through their own Kareth ravines, if you will. Times of isolation, when it seemed like no one around you understood you. When it seemed like you were by yourself. When it seems like you were all alone. Where you felt helpless, perhaps, like Elijah. You might even say that all of us, collectively, right, in our world, have been through a Kareth ravine of sorts in this pandemic that has left us feeling isolated not able to do some of the things that we've been able to do in the last year and more. Not able to have the family celebrations. Not able to come and to worship as we have known in the past at church. Not able to do many of those different things. In fact, the isolation has been very real, especially for those who have been most vulnerable. The good news for us is that as hard as it is to go through the Kareth ravines of life, we know that God is doing something in us as we go through the Kareth ravines of life. As we feel cut down, as we feel pushed down, God is doing something in us whether we know it or not. When we are feeling alone, God is doing something in us, just like he is doing something in Elijah in our story. For C Church, it's in our breaking that we are often prepared for something greater. And this leads us to the second season that God uses in Elijah's life to help him become the man of God that he wants Elijah to become. Yeah, he used a season of isolated pain as he told him to go to the Kareth Ravine, as we have seen. But he also uses a second season, and it's a season of total dependence. Not just isolated pain, but total dependence. That's that second fill in the blank, where Elijah learns that he can rely on God and God alone for what he needs. Again, picking up in our chapter in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 4, God says to Elijah, You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan, and he stayed there. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. So as Elijah experiences the loneliness and isolation of the Kareth Ravine, one thing that he doesn't have to worry about is how he's going to eat and drink. That despite the, the fact that this is a time of intense drought, God's heavenly catering service through the ravens, through the brook, provides what Elijah needs. Ravens bring food to Elijah in the morning and the evening. He has a ready source of water in the brook. Notice, church, that as God brings Elijah into the Kareth Ravine to do a work in him so that he can later use him, that he provides for Elijah. And Elijah learns total dependence. He learns to totally depend on God for what he needs. He learns that God is his provider. So too, when we're going through the Kareth ravines of life, God provides for us. Sometimes we don't see it as we're going through it. You know, it's often only when we are on the other side of a Kareth ravine that we can look back then and see how God's hand of provision was with us along the way, whether that was through a verse that we read in the scripture, through a friend who said a kind word or sent a nice note. 
or through some circumstance that God had arranged. It's often only on the other side of a Kareth ravine that we see that. But what we know is that when we go through the Kareth ravines of life, just like Elijah, we are taught dependence. We are taught and humbled that we need the Lord, that we're not as strong, we're not as mighty, we're not as self-sufficient as we thought we were. And we have to cry out to God, I need thee. Oh, how I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. I love that old hymn. I hope you do too. I hope you'll make that a prayer, a daily prayer. I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. For it's when we know our neediness, it's when we know from where and from whom our help and our strength comes from, that we begin to put ourselves in a place to be used mightily by the Lord, just like Elijah is doing. Yes, even the Kareth Ravine, God is enough. And all we have to do is pray that old prayer, give us, Lord, our daily bread. And he is faithful. God is making Elijah into a man of God, not only through a season of isolated pain, not only through a season whereby he teaches Elijah total dependence, but he's also making Elijah into a man of God whereby he teaches Elijah unconditional obedience. Picking up with verse 7 of 1 Kings chapter 17. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. The word of the Lord came to Elijah, go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. Elijah had been in the Kareth ravine for a long time. Think about it. He had become used to, accustomed to, the ravens tending to him. He had become used to, he had become accustomed to drinking from the brook, to counting on God's provision. And all of a sudden, the brook dries up. Elijah had been learning all kinds of spiritual lessons, no doubt, and the brook dries up. I can only imagine the confusion that must have beset Elijah at this point. I mean, God had been providing for him all this time, and now it seems that God has forgotten, that the brook has dried up, and that's when God speaks to him. And he calls him to move on to go to this other place, Zarephath in Sidon. Now, it's interesting, friends, that sometimes when God wants us to move on, when God wants us to go, he will dry up the brook for us. It's only sometimes when the brook is dried up that we finally have the courage to move on, when we're finally prodded to move on. Maybe you feel like the brook is dried up in your life when it comes to your job. What used to excite you and bring you joy and bring you challenge and bring you fulfillment in your work no longer does. Maybe that brook has dried up and God is calling you to move on to something new. Maybe your brook has dried up as it pertains to your finances and God is calling you to do something different with your finances. Or perhaps those friends that you've had for a long time, they've become negative. Maybe they have drained you and it's time to move on from those relationships because those friendships have become like a dry brook. Maybe you need to do something because... You are a dry book spiritually. And God wants to call you to something greater. He wants you to step out of the boat, to trust Him more, to return to your first love. See, church, God will often use, and God will dry up the brooks in our lives to prod us along, to move us, to see our situation in a different way. It's what He did for Elijah. It's what He does for us. What Elijah has learned through the dry book in the brook in the Kareth Ravine is unconditional obedience. He has learned it's time to move. And when God says move, Elijah trusts and moves. He gives him unconditional 
obedience. It's a great example for us. He is courageous. He doesn't understand completely why God is calling him to go to, the, to, go to Zarephath, but he goes. And so as he goes to a place called Zarephath, things begin to make a little bit of sense. He comes across a widow, and he asks her for some food and some drink. But like everybody else, she's been experiencing the famine. She's just gathering some sticks, preparing to make a fire to cook a last meal for her and her son so that they can go ahead and die. But Elijah asks her for food and drink. She does as Elijah instructs. And then a miracle of God's provision, the bread and the oil that the widow has, which was little, never runs out. The widow and her son and Elijah have all they need for many days because of Elijah's unconditional obedience to God to go there in the first place. But then tragedy strikes. If we were to continue reading on in 1 Kings 17, the widow's son falls ill. He dies. She, understandably, freaks out. She blames Elijah. Why did you come to me, man of God, for his death? Did you come so that my son may die? Elijah does something rather peculiar. At least I find it peculiar. Something that nobody had ever done in the Bible before. He goes up to where the dead son is, upstairs in the house. And he lays and he stretches out across his body. And he cries out to God. He prays to God, asking for the boy to re be restored. And God grants the prayer. And the boy is brought back to life. Elijah brings the boy downstairs to his mom, to the widow. And she says in 1 Kings 17, 24, now, seeing her son alive, now I know you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Amazing. Amazing. Not only that Elijah prays and God brings back this boy to life, but amazing that God used the horrible things Elijah had experienced in the Kareth Ravine to shape Elijah into a true man of God. Amazing that God would take him through those, those seasons. Elijah is only able to pray that faithful prayer that brought that boy back to life and trust God's provision that the flour and the oil would not run out because he had spent time in the Kareth Ravine and God had redeemed that time and turned and formed Elijah into the man of God that Elijah became. And we will see in the weeks to come that it was only because Elijah spent that time in the Kareth Ravine that he will be able to do the things that God is going to call him to do. Now remember verse 1 of this chapter that I told you to keep in mind when we first started this message? That verse 1 that referred to Elijah as Elijah the Tishbite. Now by the end of this chapter... Verse 24 no longer refers to Elijah as Elijah the Tishbite, but he's identified by the widow as Elijah, the man of God, the true man of God. Elijah has gone from being Elijah the Tishbite, just Elijah the Tishbite, to Elijah, the man of God, because of the work of God in Elijah's life. This time in Elijah's life, gives to us some important lessons in our faith and in our relationship with God. When God allows for us to walk through the dark valleys, to face what seem to be the obstacles that we cannot overcome, when we find ourselves in the Kareth Ravine, maybe, just maybe, maybe more than maybe, God will redeem those dark times and work within us during those times so that later he might work through us in powerful ways just like Elijah. I want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you this morning to think back to your Kareth ravines in life and ask and reflect upon how God was forming you into the woman 
or into the man that God wants you to be. Reflect, maybe, on how God is going to use that Kareth Ravine time in your life and use it to bless others and use it for His purposes. See, when we learn the lessons of, and when we learn and go through the seasons, like Elijah, of the Kareth Ravine, when we experience and learn about isolated pain and total dependence and unconditional obedience, then we'll be on our way. Then we will be well on our way, church, to being used mightily by the Lord. I hope and pray that you and I have few Kareth Ravines to go through. But I take heart that even as we do, that God stands ready to redeem those things. May it be so. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we know that as we live this life that we're not promised a life of ease, a life free from pain and difficulty and loneliness. But we rejoice that even as we go through the Kareth ravines of life, even as we find ourselves isolated, that you provide for us, that we can see your hand working in powerful ways. And we thank you that you are a God of such grace, such amazing grace, that if we we'll only be obedient, if we we'll only trust, that you stand ready to do a great work within us, even as we walk through the dark valleys of life, so that you stand ready to redeem it and to use it for your purposes. Just as you used Elijah after his time of preparation, just as you turned him into a man of God, so turn us, O God, into men and women of God. So too use us to speak to the idols and to the evil and to the injustice of this, this world that we live in. We pray all these things in your Son Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to join with me in singing our hymn after the message this morning. You can find it in your hymnal on page 467. It's called Trust and Obey. You can find the words up on your screen and or in your order of worship. Trust and Obey.
I'd like to invite you to join with me as we affirm our faith this morning. This morning we will be affirming our faith by reciting together the Apostles' Creed. You can find it printed in your order of worship this morning. Let us affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We've now come to that time in our worship where we mark our morning offering. I want to let you know that if you happen to be a guest with us this morning, I hope you'll feel no obligation to give to our church and know that our worship service this morning is our gift to you. But if you are worshiping with us this morning and Trinity United Methodist Church is your church home, whether you're a member or a regular attendee here, know that we count on you to continue the ministries of our church. And as always, we thank you for your generous contributions to the ministries of our church, especially in these uh, distinct times that we are living in. As a reminder, there's a couple of ways to give. You can give by sending in a check to our secure PO box. You can also go to our church's website to our homepage and scroll down to the bottom where you'll find a button for online giving. This time I'm going to invite you to join with me in a word of prayer and following our word of prayer we will sing the doxology. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, we thank you for every gift that you have given to us. We thank you for the gift of this day, for the gift of each other, and most of all, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in response to his great and mighty love that we make our gifts to you. May you take them all, Lord, and may you bless them and multiply them. May you cause them to work and to do your will in this community and far beyond so that they bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A couple of occasions during our worship time together this morning, I have mentioned the links in the description of the video. One of the links that you will find there, if you scroll all the way through them, is a link to our weekly trumpet. In addition to including all the happenings and special dates for our church and the news of our church, the weekly trumpet also contains the prayer list of our church. And so I invite you, as always, to take note of the prayer list and to include those persons in your daily prayer life. But this time I ask you to join with me in a time of prayer as we believe in the power of prayer here at our church. We'll end our prayer time together by saying the Lord's Prayer, the words of which you can find printed in your order of worship. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, great are you and great is your Son Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit one God forever and ever. You are the same God who has stretched out your hand over all of the earth. You provide for each and every need that we have. You are the one who has provided for every living thing. We're so grateful, Lord, for all that you have given to us. We thank you for your love and your mercy, for your peace, for your guidance for all that you give to us, O oh God. We lift up your name this morning and we praise you. We join with all of those that have come before us. 
with the saints that have gone on to glory. We join, O oh God, with those that surround your throne this morning and cast their crowns before thee. And we say that you are God and there is none like you. Well, God, we want to lift up to you this morning those that we know and love that are on our hearts because they are in need of your healing touch. Whether they are facing a, a surgery, recovering from a surgery, whether they are facing a disease, Lord, whether they are facing something that um, is just binding them, such as an addiction, or whether they are dealing with a, a mental health issue, whatever it is, Lord, that they might need healing from, you know what it is, and you are ready to pour out your healing touch. So we pray, God, as the great physician, that you pour out your healing. We also pray, O oh God, that as the great comforter, the one who gathers his sheep, that you would watch over those that grieve the loss of loved ones. We pray, O oh God, not only for those that grieve loss of loved ones, but those that are grieving any loss in their lives. And Lord, we want to pray this morning for our community and for our world. Lord, we know that until you come, that we are going to face times of tribulation, that we are going to be confronted in our world with evil. But Lord, you, we know that you don't call us to stick our heads in the sand, but that you call us to offer glimpses of your kingdom as we live in between, in this in-between time. So Lord, help us to rise up as your church, not to be impotent, not to be content to rest on our laurels, but instead, Lord, help us. Help us to be a light. Help us to be salt in this community and in this world, to be the people that you have called us to be. We make all these prayers this morning in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught his disciples and taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we started out this time of worship, I reminded you that it is a communion Sunday, and so if you haven't had the opportunity yet to gather the elements to partake of communion, I want to encourage you to go and to pause the video and to go and do so. If you just happen to be joining us this morning, I want to welcome you. We are glad that you are here and you're joining with us. And this time, I encourage you at some point to go back and to watch the rest of worship. But we are glad that you are here this morning. This morning, we will be using a service of word and table number two as it comes out of our United Methodist hymnal. However, you can find the liturgy, the words that we'll be saying for the back and forth of our worship in the order of worship, that's a link in the description of the video. As we go through that uh, liturgy, we will treat it and I will treat it much like we did the call to worship, where I will be reading all parts, both the parts that the minister usually says and the parts that the people say, but I certainly encourage you to respond at home with the words that are in bold, which are the parts for the people. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Will you join with me? Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love, and we have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And in these next moments of silence, I invite you to confess to the Lord your own individual sin, having shared our collective confession of sin. Now it is the time where we share our 
own individual sins in silence. Let us pray. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. We will continue with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice and union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever, and all God's people said, Amen. We come now to that point in our communion service where we share the bread and the cup. If you are worshiping by yourself this morning, I invite you to go ahead and to serve yourself. If you happen to be worshiping with somebody else this morning, I invite you to serve one another with the elements that are before you. As you serve the bread, you might say something like the body of Christ given for you. As you serve each other the cup, you might say something like the blood of Christ shed for you. So I invite you to go ahead and to do that, to serve one another, to spend some time in quiet reflection as Brenda Lee plays some reflection music during this time. May you partake of the elements.
Will you join me in a word of prayer? Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this bread and this cup. It is a reminder to us that just as you provided for Elijah long ago during the time of his transformation, so you provide for us through your grace, which feeds us and fills us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to join with me in singing our hymn, our final hymn this morning. It's hymn number 368, and the hymn is called My Hope is Built. You can find the words in your order of worship or there up on the screen. My Hope is Built. I want to thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning at Trinity United Methodist Church. If you were a guest with us this morning, we especially thank you for being here. We hope that you will come back on another Sunday to worship with us. As a reminder, we are worshiping uh, in person under uh, safety protocols on Sunday mornings at 1030. We would invite you to be a part of that worship as well. I also want to uh, take a moment to say a special thank you to the members of our choir that were here to uh, share in music with us. And I don't say it enough, but also a very special thank you to Luke Miller and to Brandon Lee Cooper, who were here each and every week to help to make this service a uh, possibility and to bring it to fruition for us. And now, brothers and sisters in Christ, I invite you to go from this place knowing the grace of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit and the love of Christ is with us, that it never leaves us. May you go to serve him in all that you do. And as you go, may you stay well, may you stay healthy, and may you be blessed. May you go in peace. Amen. <laughs>